So let's pray one more time. I invite you to bow your heads with me and for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I'd like to take this brief moment to remember Darlene's family before your presence. We will miss our dear sister that slept in Jesus. And Lord, uh, at the same time, we encourage ourselves with the hope of resurrection. And we pray, Lord, uh, that you will be comforting the family and that uh, the service that the Lake Orion Church will do to celebrate her life will be a blessing this afternoon for friends and family. And Lord, uh, right now we want to redirect our minds to your word. And you have taught us to pray for the Holy Spirit, to guide us into all truth. And we pray now that the Spirit will give us a special enlightenment. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Guarding the heart. What does it come to your mind when we talk about guarding the heart? Are we talking about the literal heart? I want to share a true case of a woman that had a heart transplant, literal heart transplant. After the surgery, she began to have these dreams that she was being followed and, and persecuted and attacked. And the dream was very disturbing for her, and she would wake up in the middle of the night scared. But she said, it was just a dream. It's just a one-time thing. But the dream kept repeating other nights as well. The same thing. Somebody running after this woman and attacking her to the point of taking her life. And again, she would wake up scared in the middle of the night, sweating, and the dream persisted. Finally, she said that to the doctor that did her surgery, that she's having these dreams since the time she had this heart transplant. The doctor was also a researcher, and he was very intrigued with what she was saying, and he decided to check who was the person that donated the heart. The woman that donated the heart had been murdered. The police didn't know who was the person that did it. They didn't have enough information. The dreams continued to come in the mind of this lady. And finally, it was arranged for her to help the police to find the person that murdered that woman. And sure enough, the police was able to find the person through those dreams. The doctor researching more and trying to understand uh, why he understood that the heart, the literal heart, also has neurons that communicates with other neurons in our nervous system, including the brain. And the neurons of this woman that had already passed was communicating with the neurons of this woman that received her heart, and that's why she was having these dreams. This same researcher, he looked into other cases. There was one that maybe it can be comic for some. This lady that was already advanced in age, she began to look for her husband sexually more often than usual. And when the researcher saw who was the person that gave that heart, it was somebody that had already engaged in, in prostitution. 
And there are many cases like that in heart transplants. But when the Bible talks about the heart, I don't question that includes all our neurons that communicate in our bodies, including our intestines also have neurons. And that's why we must take care of our diet because it influences the way we think as well. But the Bible goes even deeper, and I want to share with you a passage in the Scriptures. You are welcome to turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 139. And before we read this verse here in Psalms 139, I want to teach you a principle of biblical hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. The book of Psalms, especially, not limited to the book of Psalms, but especially the book of Psalms has a lot of Hebrew poetry. What kind of poetry did I say, everyone? And Hebrew poetry has this style of rhyming the thoughts. Rhyming what, everyone, again? The thoughts, not rhyming the words like in Western poetry. Okay, so they seek to rhyme the thoughts. They say one sentence one thing, and then they repeat the same thought, the same idea with different words. They don't mind about the words, but they mind about the thoughts in order to emphasize the point. So with that in mind, let's read uh, Psalms 139, verse 23, to understand a little bit more about the heart, because the message is entitled, Guarding My Heart. Search me, O God, and know my, what is the next word? Heart. Now, notice the repetition of thought in the next sentence. Try me, which is equal to search me, and know my, what, everyone? Thoughts, which is equal to what, everyone? The heart. So, therefore, when the Bible talks about the heart, it includes our thoughts, our minds, our feelings, Everything in our body that expresses ideas and feelings and thoughts, especially our brain. And Jesus said to us in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, the pure in mind and thoughts and feelings, for they shall see God. What a beautiful promise. Would you say amen for that? And I think it begins to... Hint here why the message guarding my heart because it says that the pure in heart is the one that will see God. We as Seventh day Adventists, we believe that Jesus is coming soon. Amen for that? And we also teach that we need to be prepared for that event. And part of that preparation includes purifying our hearts through the merits of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the teachings of the Scriptures. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that includes feelings and thoughts which compose the character. Feelings and thoughts make up the character, which is deeper than the personality, is the essence of the individual, who he is, who she is. Notice what we also find, uh, and you're welcome to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Let's turn our Bibles there, if you will. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Now, I want you to see the command, so to speak. We could consider that way that we find there. In verse 16, the Bible says, Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So God is inviting us to be pure in heart and to be holy. That's the gospel message, friends. The gospel includes more than forgiveness of sins. It includes also the transformation of the heart, the mind, the thoughts, the feelings, the character. And of course, God is holy in his own sphere, and we will never attain the holiness of God 
we will keep growing into his image, into his likeness throughout eternity. Nevertheless, he's inviting us to partake of that holiness even today. And now he comes the famous verse in Proverbs 4, verse 23. What are, what are the next three words there? Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. We have here this command to keep our hearts with all diligence. How do we keep our hearts? How do we keep, you know, our thoughts and feelings and our character with all diligence so we keep it pure and keep it holy to the Lord? I'd like to suggest that there are avenues to our hearts. There are what, everyone? Avenues to our hearts. And God knows that. He created us that way. But unfortunately, Satan also knows that. And he takes advantage of that. And here are the avenues of our hearts, the things that stimulate our thoughts and feelings. It is our senses, our vision, our hearing, our smell, and taste, and touch. I want to take you to the book of Genesis for a moment, and I want you to see how Satan took advantage of that in Genesis chapter 3. I want you to go there with me. I'm going to read a few verses in this chapter, Genesis chapter 3. And uh, some of you may know the story we have from the very beginning God told Adam and Eve that they should not partake of a certain tree, of a certain fruit as a test of loyalty. There was nothing wrong with the fruit per se, but it was a test of loyalty to God. But Satan wanted to overcome Adam and Eve and become the prince of this world and steal the world from the hands of Adam and Eve that God had given them and also make humanity slaves to himself. And I want you to see that Satan, in trying to divert the mind of Eve, he did not choose to come, in, come to her the way he actually is, but he disguised himself using a medium. What did he use? Oh, yes, he used a serpent, right? A snake. Let's pick up the story in verse 4. And I want you to see the senses of Eve being stimulated with things that would affect her feelings and thoughts. And by doing that, the serpent was able to lead her into rebellion against God. Notice what it says in verse 4. The Bible says, then the serpent, the serpent, what everyone? Said to the woman, so her earrings... Hearing, I should say, was being stimulated. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Was that true, yes or no? It was not. So she was being stimulated through her hearing, and she was hearing things that were contrary to the teachings of God. But it doesn't stop there. I want you to see that the attack was from every angle. In verse 5, we read, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, So when the woman, and what is next word now? Saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the, to the eyes. Her sight is being now stimulated, affecting it. Her mind, and she saw that the fruit was good for food. How did she see that the fruit was good for food? It's just my own thought here. It is possible that the serpent was eating the fruit, and that's why she saw that the fruit was good for food. So she saw that the fruit was good for food. You know, in, in Spirit of Prophecy, it says that the serpent was eating the fruit with apparent delight. Really? Did God say that? 
That's not true. You shall not surely die. Taking a bite. Now her hearing is being stimulated. Her sight is being stimulated. But it doesn't stop there. And the tree desired to make one wise. She, what is the next word? Took her touch. She took. Nothing happened. She took what she was not supposed to touch. She took of its fruit and ate that her taste. I want you to see that Eve is being bombarded from every angle. Her sight is telling her that God is lying to her. Her hearing is telling her that God is lying to her. Her touch is telling her that God is lying to her. She eats, and when she eats, it's saying that God is lying to her. Now her thoughts were changed through the avenues of the soul, and she rebelled against God. Friends, could Satan still be using the same strategy today, yes or no? Oh, make no mistake, he was successful with Eve that had an unfallen nature, meaning a nature that was not pruned to evil. How much more with us that has a fallen nature pruned to evil, he can also succeed in the same way. I want to read a statement in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, which shows that God knows that as well and he also reaches our hearts through the avenues of the soul second corinthians chapter 3 and we're going to read verse 18 let's unpack this verse for a moment second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 the apostle paul says but we all with unveiled face what is the next word now beholding what what does it mean to behold contemplating right beholding as in a mirror the glory of the lord what is the glory of god his character who he is that's his glory yes it includes his power and all that but especially who he is his character and the apostle says beholding or contemplating as in a mirror because we don't see god uh, in the way he is, we contemplate in him through his teachings, through his word, through maybe a Bible studies or uh, a Bible study or conversing with other people or through the impressions of the Holy Spirit. We behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, our being what happens when we contemplate, our being transformed. Oh, yes, our brains have what we call the, the mirror cells. Have you heard about them? And that's why we have the saying, monkey see, monkey do, right? Because of the mirror cells, they see it and they reproduce. And the apostle is saying exactly that. When we behold God's glory, when we contemplate God's glory, we are being transformed into the same image, the image of God. From glory to glory, from one level of God's character to the next, we call sanctification. And that all happens when we behold God's glory. He knows that. And he is also appealing to our hearts through our senses. I just want to be up front here this morning. Some of the ways that Satan is taking advantage of the avenues of the souls and how God is taking advantage of that as well. Because there is a battle and the battle is for our hearts. God wants us to purify our hearts and Satan wants to corrupt our hearts. Notice this, through a meeting as well, which we call media, through television and internet, excessive, what now? 
violence, sex, and total lack of decency and morals have invaded where? Our homes. Now we have no idea who's inside our home. Maybe physically, just the family, but virtually, online, who are molding the minds of our children and our own minds, depending on what we are watching and listening and what we are beholding. The home is no longer that safeguard that used to be where you could come and find love and safety, but the home now is invaded with all kinds of influence. It is common in our days to have children very young with cell phones and iPads and all kinds of devices that are molding their experience. Notice that the average 18-year-old has witnessed 200,000 violent acts on television and movies, including 40,000, what? Murder. And friends, without a moral compass, our society is thrown into a state of what? Confusion. What is the that moral compass which we should make our decisions to what we see and what we hear and what we touch and what we eat. What is that moral compass? The Bible, the Word of God, and that includes the commandments of God. God's law is the basis of morality and the standard of judgment as well. It is through God's law that we recognize our need of a Savior, and it is the Savior who writes the law of God on the tables of our hearts. Let's just revisit the commandments for a moment, just a few of them. Thou shalt not, what, everyone? Kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. These are, these are just some of them. But friends, if these things are sinful, and we all acknowledge that they are, and that Christians, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are taught in the Word to abstain from those things, why all of a sudden we say it is okay to watch those things? Let me read this statement here. Christians recognize that it is a sin to lie, to kill, to steal, to commit adultery, but when it comes to being entertained by watching or reading about others breaking these commandments, we manage to rationalize that it is what? It is okay. I'm not doing it, I'm just watching others doing it, so therefore it is okay. But are we really protecting our homes? in our hearts. How do you protect moral values in a, what kind of world? Immoral world. Friends, again, we go back to the Word of God. And uh, we measure all things by the Word of God. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Let's go to Philippians 4 verse 8. And uh, we are going to find in this verse... Well, I would say the principles for entertainment. We all need to rest a while and maybe um, perhaps watch something that uh, would relax our minds. You know, the word amusement, it comes from that notion of not thinking, okay? So we all need uh, sometimes amusement to relax and so forth. But what is the standard? It is found in the Word of God, in the commandments of God. Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brother, whatever things are, what is the next word? True, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Other translation says, think on these things. 
Friends, I'm not sure if you followed, but this verse is giving you the recipe for what you should watch, for what you should look upon, for what you should read, for what you should listen to. Just a summary here for us. It must be true. You go by that. So I'm not here to prescribe in every case, but we are giving a mind to think and reason and come to conclusions based on the principles of God's word. You judge it. If you are watching a movie or if you are listening to uh, a podcast or whatever you are engaging, you judge if it is true, if it is noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report. If there is any virtue or it is praiseworthy, and then it is fine. But if not, it's not fine, friends. It will affect the heart. Non-religious films can be used for educational purposes like documentaries and movies. But you need to ask yourself, is there any virtue here? Is it lovely? Is it even truth? Like our children sometimes are watching things that are unrealistic, that doesn't exist in real life. And they don't have the same filter that the adults have. David said, I will set nothing, what's the next word? Wicked before my eyes. He wrote this after his sin against uh, God when he committed adultery. Maybe you remember the story. He decided not to go to war in that occasion. He went up on the roof when he couldn't sleep. So instead of being in warfare for God, he went um, to his palace. He couldn't sleep that night. He went up in the roof and he saw from afar this woman. And she was beautiful to look upon. And he continued to look and to contemplate. We all know the saying that we cannot prevent the birds to fly over our heads, but we can prevent them to make what? Nest upon our heads, right? So we cannot prevent thoughts to come into our minds and pop out into our minds, but we can prevent those thoughts from governing our reason. Does that make sense? And when we shun those thoughts away through faith, claiming the power of the Holy Spirit, our soul is not contaminated by sinful thoughts. But David failed that time. He suffered the consequences miserably for his sin. But now he's writing, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. We also should make the same commitment. This is the gospel message, friends. The Bible contains stories of war, violence, and murder as well, but these behaviors are not, what is the next word? Uplifted. That's not the purpose of the Bible, to uplift those things. In fact, the very story of David it is to show the misery of adultery. And it wasn't make it glamour how movies can make sin to appear Glamour. I want to read uh, from the book Discipleship Handbook on page 178. While these media are not inherently evil, media is not evil per se, Christians should abstain from beholding any entertainment, entertainment that glorifies violence or vice, promotes Godless behavior provokes envy or lust, uses inappropriate language, or in any other way dishonors God. Going back to the notion that, but I'm not doing, I'm just watching. In Romans chapter 1, the apostle lists a series of sins that will 
bring the judgment of God upon the unrepented soul. And then he adds the the following. Let's just read the beginning verse 29. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness. So these people are being filled. They They are feeding themselves with unrighteousness, with sexual immorality, with wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, and what else? Murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, bolsters, inventors of evil things, disobedience to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also, what is the next word? Approve of those who practice them. Friends, when we are watching, when we are reading, when we are listening to things that are promoting ungodly things, we are approving. And we also become guilt. Another statement from the same book, Discipleship Handbook, instead of turning to Jesus as our place of refuge, a growing number of Christians are turning to what kind of things? Fiction or fantasy. Through video games, social media, and fictional novels, many are seeking an alternate reality rather than striving to be content and what kind of person? productive in their own lives. So here another concept plays in, and that is being productive, because certain things could be all right if it was done in moderation, but because we take all our time and energy and maybe even finances, then it becomes problematic. It's about balance. The devil uses this escapes which can be highly addictive to keep God's people from the practical duties of life and from sharing the gospel with the world. Precious moments, even days, weeks, months, and years are water away focusing on a world that is entirely imaginary. Here are certain things that we can do to keep our hearts with all diligence. Set internet time limits for you and your family. Keep your computers in areas visible to others, especially if they are minor. So you want to make sure you know what kind of things your children are watching and uh, exploring. Use software that filters website content and refuses access to certain types of sites. I heard, I, I never um, seen myself, but uh, a friend told me that there is one software that if your child accesses a website, it will come to your computer for authorization first. So you don't need to be always you know, physically there to authorize, when you have access to your computer, it will pop out the websites that your children are asking authorization to navigate. Friends, the devil is not playing. And we have sometimes no idea what is in the cell phones of our children. No idea. There was a preacher just came to my mind. I'm not saying what he said, but I'm saying what he said. (laughs) He said to the parents, grab the phone right now. And I'm not saying for you to do that. And check what is in the cell phones of your children. And you will be surprised. Go to bed early and get up in the morning for your devotional time with God. Make a covenant with your eyes. Notice what Job said. I have made a covenant with my what? My eyes. We can make a covenant with our eyes. 
But as I said, God also utilizes media to reach the heart through TV and Internet and radio. These are means to spread the gospel. We have several as a church TV channels or websites that you can watch like Hope Channel, Amazing Facts, Voice of Prophecy, It Is Written, 3ABN. I just listed here the ones that are more known, but there are so many more. As a church, we have produced movie as well. This is one of them, Tell the World, which tells the history of our church. The ministry Amazing Facts have done the um, cosmic conflict to understand the, the war between good and evil, final events. This is a little bit more recent, The Days of Noah, a four-part series that you can find in Amazon Prime. For children, you have uh, the General Conference, Mission 360 TV. My children love to watch that one for sundown worship. So we do our worship, and then we eat together, and then they watch a few of those which tell true stories about missionaries. You can listen to, to audio verse, which has thousands of sermons on various topics, and I'm sure there are other good websites. But I want to share one with you, which is the app, the Spirit of Prophecy app, which has the writings of Ellen White. Recently, I decided to listen to the nine volumes of Testimonies for the Church. And it's so much easier than actually taking the time to read. I do my personal devotionals, but when I'm driving, especially long distance, like 30-minute drive, 40-minute drive, I can listen to the testimonies. I already covered nine chapters. Praise God. So after I finish all nine volumes of the testimonies, I will go to other books. And uh, you can even choose your preferred language. I'm not saying you're going to find any language there, but there are several. And I chose the language of heaven. I'm listening in Portuguese. <laughs> Make sure I don't lose it. But nothing can replace a quiet time with God when we are reading the Word of God. Amen? And some of you may say, but I read the Bible and I don't understand. This is very common. You're not alone. So I have heard many people saying that before. Here is a recommendation of mine, but you may have other resources that can help you. I want to recommend what we call the Conflict of the Age series. And this is a five-volume series from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. Okay, so you have patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, the desire of the ages, referring to the life and ministry of Jesus, Acts of the Apostles, it covers also some of the general epistles. And then you have the great controversy, which is a commentary on the book of Revelation. Friends, we need to get serious because the attacks of the enemy is in all sides and the appeals of God is in all sides. And we are urged in Romans 12, verse 2, as we learn in children's story, if you're paying attention, and do not be conformed. What it means to be conformed, uh, Jennifer? Is she here? Okay, she li okay. Be like. Do not be conformed to this world, but be, what is the next word? Transformed. And we learned we are transformed by beholding, by contemplating the things we see, the things we read, the things we meditate upon the things we listen to these are the things that are shaping our feelings and thoughts and our character do not be conformed to this world the world will conform you but do not be conformed to this world 
but be transformed by the renewing of your, what's the next word? Mind. Can I say heart? Oh, yes. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to close this message with a story in the book of Acts chapter 19. Let's go there quickly, if you will. Acts chapter 19, we have a story here of the missions of Paul, and there was these people that were coming from paganism, all kind of witchcraft that they were practicing. And uh, some of them were half converted, and they wouldn't get rid of their witchcraft things that they had. And friends, just so you can follow the parallel, I believe we also have things that are compared to the witchcraft things that those people had that needed to be eliminated, that needs to be eliminated. Whatever it is that is in our house, it is in our phones, in our computer, in our bookshelves, that are not of God, needs to come out, friends. It needs to come out. One time I heard this illustration of a man that was willing to give up everything that belonged to the devil except a nail. Now, let me take a step back. Actually, Satan said, you may get rid of everything, but just let me put that nail on the wall. And the man said, that's fine. It's just an illustration. It's not a true story. The man said, that's fine. You can have the nail on the wall. And then Satan came with this terrible piece of carcass and hanged that carcass on the nail. And he said, what are you doing? This is my house. Yes, the house is yours, but you gave me the nail. The nail is mine. And that's where we give openings to the devil to reach the heart. Notice, let's read here what happened in this story. There is a happy ending on this story here because finally the people were fully committed to Jesus Christ. And in verse 19 we read, Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and did what with them? Burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. They were willing to sacrifice. Yes, we paid a lot of money for this, but this is not of God. This book does not belong to God. They must go. This CD, this DVD, this app, this whatever you have downloaded in your computer, if it is not of God, it must go. But I paid for it. Look the example. They burned them up. But what is so much amazing is what comes next. Notice in verse 20. After they did that, so the word of the Lord grew, how? Mightily and prevailed. Friends, we are in a mission, friends. We are proclaiming the most solemn message before the coming of Jesus. And that's the three angels' messages. We want the word of God to grow mightily and prevail everywhere in the hearts of people. We want the preaching of the gospel to break through the darkness of immorality and violence and witchcraft and all kinds of wicked practices that the world throws at us but if we are entertaining ourselves with those things why would the word of God grow mightily and prevail through our ministry notice here this week and this is the appeal that comes from the book Discipleship on page 181, I think. This week, consider what might need to be 
removed from our life. Think not only of sinful habits, which are more obvious, and practices that pollute the heart, but also of those things that may not be inherently evil, but which does what? Steal your best energies because of intemperance, because of lack of balance and affections from God. It could be movies or music that dishonor the Lord, internet or sports that occupy your time and receive your deepest interest, video games or novels that weaken your desire for spiritual things, or anything that strengthens your carnal nature rather than helping you to maintain purity and singleness of heart. After addressing any idols that may exist in your heart and life, consider what positive influences could be put in their place. Be a regular attendee at prayer meeting and other church functions, especially missions. Open your home for a small group Bible study. Get regular exercise and try to remain active. Spend more time with your family. Amen for that? And all this is because... Jesus wants us to have joy and abound in his joy. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be how? Full. He will never take anything away from us that would be good for us. And friends, if you're struggling with that, I invite you to give it to Jesus. Say, Jesus I'm having a hard time to surrender, but I pray that you help me to surrender, and I give you permission to take those things from my life, and he will give you the power, for we can do all things through Christ that strengthen us. May God bless us.